Hi, I'm Dr. Ted Delbridge, Executive Director of MEMS. It certainly has been a trying year, yet despite managing a pandemic and all the things that we've done in the meantime, we've managed to update the Maryland EMS protocols for EMS clinicians. We hope that you find the changes that we've made significant and making them easier to reference and more compact and useful for EMS clinicians in the field. We recognize the one thing we ask of you that you can never get back is your personal time. And so in advance, thank you for taking time out to review this year's protocol updates and know that we are on a journey to continuously make them better. Thank you for everything you do every single day. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Maryland EMS protocol update. I'm Dr. Tim Chismar, Maryland State EMS Medical Director. I'd like to start by taking a moment to say thank you to all of our EMS clinicians for your continued commitment to exceptional patient care during the COVID-19 pandemic. The challenges have been all too real. For long time spent in personal protective equipment, staying apart from family members while in quarantine, and coping with the loss of family members and coworkers. In addition to this, Maryland's EMS community continues to step up to provide vaccines in our communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. So on behalf of all Marylanders, thank you. We hope that you will enjoy a new look and format to the Maryland EMS protocols this year, what I've dubbed Protocol 2.0. Based on feedback from across the state, we've re redesigned the protocols with a few goals in mind. First, to give you, our EMS clinicians, a succinct, evidence-based medical protocol to provide high-quality care to our patients. This streamlined protocol limits repetition it focuses on just what you need to know when taking care of patients in their living room or in the back of the ambulance. In addition to removing redundant material, we've made the protocols easier to access the information you need in rapid fashion. Protocol topic areas are color-coded for quick reference. The ALS, BLS, and medical consult sections are clearly delineated in boxes and are color-coded as well. And if you're using an electronic version of the protocol document, you may click on any medication name or link protocol in italics, and you'll be able to easily access related information. Finally, you should know that our protocols reflect best practices from the scientific literature, national EMS scope of practice, and national model clinical guidelines. Together with our protocol review committee, I will continue to evaluate these sources and modify our protocols accordingly. During this update, you will learn about content changes this year in the areas of agitation, stroke, respiratory care, and burn management, just to name a few. You should also be aware that we have changed the epinephrine concentration convention to meet FDA standards. What was previously known as epinephrine 1 to 1,000 will now be referred to as epinephrine 1 milligram per ml, and what was known as epinephrine 1 to 10,000 is now epinephrine 0 0.1 milligrams per ml. These revisions were required to prevent medication errors related to strength being expressed as a ratio instead of concentration in milligrams per ml. Finally, please take a few minutes to familiarize yourself with the new Protocol 2.0. I hope you will find the new layout gives you faster access to the information you need during a call. Also, please take a moment to take care of yourself. If you need support, reach out to your peers, department resources, or visit the Maryland COVID-19 Crisis Support Program for support services at no cost. In closing, I'm proud to be part of the Maryland EMS system, and I hope that you are as well. Thank you for taking time to learn about our new protocols. Please be safe, take care of yourselves, each other, and our patients. While the new format of the protocols in 2021 is the most obvious change, there have been several other changes to the patient care standards this year. One such change involves the addition of distinct protocols for the treatment of both adult and pediatric hypo and hyperglycemia. Previously, guidance was dispersed through multiple treatment and procedure protocols. For BLS clinicians, the use of a glucometer to check blood glucose levels has been changed from an optional protocol to a statewide standard. Jurisdictions will implement this change as they are able to purchase new equipment, but glucometers are expected to be available to BLS clinicians no later than July of 2022. Based upon blood glucose levels, 
as determined by the use of the glucometer by both ALS and BLS clinicians, there are now distinct treatment regimens that address those findings. The indications for the implementation of this protocol include, but are not limited to, a blood glucose level less than 70 mg per deciliter or one that is 300 mg per deciliter or greater, patient reported high or low blood glucose, diabetic patients with other medical symptoms such as vomiting, or patients with an altered mental status or found unconscious. You should be sure to review this new protocol to recognize all the listed indications. For BLS treatment, your first step should be to check the blood glucose level using the glucometer. If you find the level to be below 70 mg per deciliter, you should administer 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste between the patient's gum and cheek. If, after 10 minutes, the patient has not improved, you should administer an additional dose of 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste. You respond on a BLS unit to the report of a patient with a decreased level of consciousness. Upon arrival, you find a 34-year-old male unconscious with a pulse of 100 and a respiratory rate of 14. He is wearing a medical alert bracelet that identifies a history of diabetes. Family members on the scene report that the patient has had a stomach virus for two days, causing vomiting and diarrhea, yet the patient has continued his normal insulin doses. You check the patient's blood glucose and you note a reading of 38 milligrams per deciliter. The appropriate treatment regimen for a BLS provider would be administer 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste between the patient's gum and cheek, administering an additional dose of 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste if not improved after 10 minutes. Transfer care to the ALS unit if available and transport is not delayed. Administer 100 to 150 milligrams of glucose paste between the patient's gum and cheek, administering an additional dose of 500 milligrams of glucose paste if not improved in 20 minutes. That's right. The correct dose for this patient is 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste between the patient's gum and cheek. It is no secret that the treatment of suspected stroke patients has been continually evolving over the past several years. This year's protocols reflect the evidence-based changes following the Baltimore City LAMS research protocol success last year. Because of this success, which is reinforced by scientific data, the criteria used for the study is now our statewide treatment standard. While I will go through the protocol briefly here, it is imperative that you take the time to review and learn what is expected of you as you treat these stroke patients. The indications of a suspected stroke beyond numbness or weakness that is often on only one side may also include blurred vision, which may have resolved prior to your arrival, difficulty speaking, sudden onset of dizziness or loss of balance, and a severe unexplained headache. When your patient assessment reveals any of these symptoms, you should start down the treatment outlined in the stroke protocol. First, position your patient with their head elevated at 30 degrees. Check their blood sugar levels with the glucometer. If their blood sugar is below 70 milligrams per deciliter, treat according to the hypoglycemia protocol. If the patient is under 18 years of age, provide them with oxygen at 2 to 6 liters per minute via nasal cannula unless they are hypoxic or in respiratory distress. For adult patients, provide oxygen only if the patient's pulse ox is less than 94%. Assess the patient using the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. If there is any abnormality noted when assessing facial droop, arm drift, or speech, consider this a positive sign for stroke. You would also want to perform a posterior cerebellar assessment for any abnormality in balance or vision. If you discover abnormal findings on either the Cincinnati or posterior cerebellar assessment, consider the possibility of a large vessel occlusion stroke and calculate the patient's Los Angeles motor scale score in relation to facial droop, arm drift, and grip strength. This LAM score will be important when determining where to transport the patient. For a LAMS score of 0-3, 
transport the patient to the closest designated acute stroke ready primary or comprehensive stroke center. For a LAM score of four or greater, transport to the closest comprehensive stroke center or thrombectomy capable primary stroke center. If the patient cannot be delivered to the center within 30 minutes, go to the closest designated acute stroke ready or primary stroke center. Importantly, use of aviation will not generally be able to deliver a patient to one of these centers within 30 minutes. If a suspected stroke patient is greater than 30 minutes from any stroke center, transport to the closest hospital or request aviation if there would be a time savings. Pediatric patients with suspected stroke, those who have not reached their 18th birthday, consult local base station and pediatric base station to arrange transport to a pediatric trauma center. It is also important that you obtain and document a phone number for one or more individuals who have knowledge of the patient's presenting symptoms, last known well time, and medical history. This information must be communicated to the receiving hospital staff. ALS care for the suspected stroke patient should include the establishment of IV access, preferably on the unaffected side of the body, and obtaining blood samples. Consult for all suspected stroke patients as soon as possible. You should use the verbiage priority one stroke alert patient with a last known well time of insert time. If the patient is hypotensive, obtain medical consultation. However, do not treat hypertension with medications in the field. You are on the scene with a 74-year-old female patient who is experiencing sudden onset right side hemiparesis, facial droop, and a new inability to speak. The patient was last seen well 10 hours ago. The patient has a LAM score of 5. You are 10 minutes from a primary stroke center and 25 minutes from the closest comprehensive stroke center. According to the 2021 stroke protocol, where should you transport this patient? Primary Stroke Center. Comprehensive Stroke Center. That's correct. This patient should be transported to the Comprehensive Stroke Center 25 minutes away. You have the same patient as in question number one, but now you are 10 minutes from the primary stroke and 45 minutes from the closest comprehensive or thrombectomy capable primary stroke center. According to the 2021 stroke protocol, which of the following methods should be used to transport the patient? Use aviation to transport to the more distant, comprehensive, or thrombectomy-capable primary stroke center. Transport by ground to the primary stroke center. Aviation will not likely be able to deliver the patient to the more distant center within 30 minutes. Certain patients are eligible for the clot-busting medication, called TPA, and longer transport times could put some patients outside of the time window for this medication. You have the same patient as in question number one, but you are 40 minutes from any stroke center. Aviation is available to transport the patient if needed and could deliver the patient to a stroke center within 30 minutes. Which of the following methods should be used to transport the patient? Transport to the closest local hospital ETA, 40 minutes. Aviation for transport, ETA, 30 minutes. Aviation would result in a time savings and you are more than 30 minutes from any stroke center. A would be the correct answer if aviation were not able to transport the patient within a shorter period of time than ground transport. Although the treatment and transport of patients suffering from snake bites in Maryland are somewhat rare, we do respond to these calls on occasion. It is helpful to refresh our memory on appropriate management for these patients. While the protocol changes this year were minor, they do bring two changes in the treatment that you will provide as EMS clinicians. The first of these changes is that you will no longer apply ice packs to a snake bite injury. The second change is that you should not attempt to capture the snake or transport it to the hospital. Instead of bringing the snake, simply attempt to take a picture of the snake and bring that with the patient, if it can be done safely. In order to show you how this all fits together, allow me to run through the content of the protocol. When you begin assessing the patient, 
Look for indications like localized pain, puncture wounds, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, altered mental status, or hypoperfusion. Once again, it is important that you review the protocol in its entirety so you'll be able to recognize the indications of a snake bite and a reaction. Beginning with the BLS care for a snake bite patient with moderate to severe allergic reaction symptoms or mild symptoms with a history of life-threatening allergic reactions to a prior snake bite. Consider epinephrine, 1 mg per milliliter, given IM or using an auto-injector. The dose for ages 5 and older is 0.5 mg IM or using an auto-injector for adults, while the dose for a child less than 5 years old is 0.15 mg IM or a pediatric auto-injector. You may also consider the administration of albuterol, 2.5 mg nebulized or through a multi-dose inhaler, two puffs inhaled, as long as the patient is over two years old. If the patient is under two, the albuterol dose is 1.25 mg nebulized or two puffs inhaled from the MDI. Remember to remove all jewelry on the affected extremity and immobilize that extremity as soon as possible. You should take a picture of the snake, if possible, but do not attempt to capture or transport it to the hospital. When treating a poisonous snake bite, do not apply distal or proximal constricting bands, apply ice packs, locally incise the bite, copiously wash the wound, or attempt to remove the venom by sucking or suctioning. While this may look good in old movies, sucking on a snake wound is clearly a no-no in regards to the protocol. ALS clinicians, beyond the BLS treatment already described, should establish IV access and give a 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus of lactated ringers, if indicated, in the uninjured extremity. Titrate to a systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury for adults, or age-appropriate blood pressure for pediatric patients. You respond to an injured person at a single-family home in the countryside. Upon arrival, you find a 63-year-old male sitting on his patio and holding his right hand in pain. His wife, on the scene, explains that he was cleaning the ivy off the side of the house and was bit by a copperhead on his hand. Assessment reveals that the patient has two puncture wounds to his hand with profound swelling and tingling in his fingertips. The patient complains of slight nausea. He appears a little pale, but his skin is dry. His vital signs are blood pressure of 118 over 74, pulse rate of 100, and a respiratory rate of 20. Based upon the new stake bite protocol, correct treatment considerations for this patient would include immobilization of the injured right hand and taking a picture of the snake if possible, application of ice packs to the right hand to treat the pain and swelling from the bite. That's right. According to the 2021 snake bite protocol, correct treatment considerations for this patient would include the immobilization of the affected extremity and taking a picture of the snake, if it can be done safely, to share with the receiving medical staff at the hospital. Ice packs should not be placed on a snake bite. The appropriate treatment of a patient, whether adult or pediatric, suffering from agitation can be challenging and may be anxiety-provoking for the EMS clinician. The goal is to reduce the patient's agitation and get them the help that they need. Patients experiencing agitation are stratified into mild, moderate, and severe symptomology for the purposes of determining the most appropriate treatment. According to the 2021 protocols, mild agitation is indicated by a patient that is agitated but cooperative and making rational decisions. There is no immediate concern for patient or clinician safety. Moderate agitation is indicated by a patient who is irrational and exhibiting behavior that puts themselves or clinicians at risk. Severe agitation symptoms are demonstrated by a patient who is physically violent and presents an immediate and imminent threat to themselves or others. 
The BLS treatment for agitation revolves around safety and causation. EMS clinicians should maintain scene safety and have a low threshold for the requesting additional resources, including law enforcement when dealing with an agitated patient. Attempt to decrease external stimuli by speaking calmly with the patient at their level in a quiet environment if possible. Look at the patient and assess their capacity and risk for self-harm. Consider the causes of the agitation, such as medical emergency, head trauma, psychiatric disturbance, or drug or alcohol ingestion. For a patient experiencing mild agitation, the EMS clinician should attempt to verbally de-escalate the situation and provide emotional support using the SAFER model. Stabilize the situation by containing and lowering the stimuli. Assess and acknowledge the crisis. Facilitate the identification and activation of resources, such as a chaplain, family, friends, or police. Encourage the patient to use resources and take actions in their best interest. Act to ensure recovery or referral by leaving the patient in the care of a responsible person or professional or transport the patient to receive needed care. If the patient is found to have moderate to severe agitation upon assessment, ALS assistance should be requested by BLS clinicians as these patients often require pharmacologic intervention to protect both patient and EMS clinician safety. You respond to a sick person at a local diner. You arrive to find an adult male in front of the restaurant who is pacing and seemingly talking to himself. Your assessment leads you to believe that he is agitated, but he is cooperative and able to make rational decisions. There does not appear to be any immediate concern for patient or clinician safety. The symptoms of agitation demonstrated by this patient would best be described as mild, moderate, severe. That's correct. A patient that is agitated but yet cooperative and making rational decisions prompting no immediate concern for patient or clinician safety would be considered mildly agitated and should be approached by using the SAFER model. BLS clinicians in the state of Maryland have long had the ability to administer albuterol to patients who are suffering trouble breathing or wheezing using a patient-prescribed handheld aerosol inhaler. This administration route is not new. However, beginning on the 1st of July, BLS clinicians will also be able to administer albuterol using a sterile unit dose delivered to the patient using a nebulizer from their ambulance. This is a medically appropriate addition to the EMT's list of skills and brings Maryland in line with current national standards. Of note, this change will occur gradually over the next year as EMS operational programs provide training and equipment to BLS clinicians. The indications for the administration of albuterol are unchanged. They include signs and symptoms of respiratory distress or bronchospasm and wheezing associated with asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, or allergic reactions. In addition to the handheld unit dosage of two doses of two puffs each for four puffs total, the nebulizer dose must also be remembered by BLS clinicians. The sterile unit dose of albuterol given by BLS personnel to adults will be 2.5 milligrams, which may be given a maximum of two times over a 30-minute period. Infants and children less than two years of age should receive 1.25 milligrams of nebulized albuterol, while the adult dose of 2.5 milligram applies to children two years of age and older. Keep in mind that any additional doses will require medical consultation. BLS will not administer ipratropium or atrovent. This remains an ALS-only medication. To administer the nebulized albuterol, you will first assemble the nebulizer as needed. EMS operational programs will provide training as needed over the next year. You should ensure that you are familiar with the specific nebulizer equipment carried on your ambulance. In general terms, the typical setup involves a nebulizer chamber, oxygen tubing, a mouthpiece, and exhaust tube. 
Once you have assembled the nebulizer, place the contents of the unit dose vial of albuterol into the nebulizer chamber. Turn the oxygen supply on at 6 liters per minute and have the patient place the mouthpiece into their mouth while they inhale the medication through their mouth. Observe the patient for any of the known side effects to albuterol, which may include a jittery or nervous feeling, rapid or fluttering heartbeat. The patient should be provided with reassurance that these symptoms, while bothersome, are usually short-lived. EMS operational programs will be providing training and equipment over the next year as part of the BLS albuterol protocol implementation. It will be your responsibility to learn the equipment that you have available on your ambulance, as well as making sure that you understand and know the protocols and when to apply them. We know that you will appreciate having the increased ability to provide aid to those in need. Of note, ALS response should still be requested or permitted to continue their response for patients experiencing respiratory distress, as the patient may need additional treatments beyond albuterol. You respond to a sick person at a nearby farm. Upon arrival, you find a 20-year-old female patient complaining of shortness of breath and wheezing from an asthma attack. The patient reports that she normally uses an albuterol inhaler, but she ran out and had not picked up her new prescription yet. You decide it would be prudent to administer albuterol to the patient using a nebulizer. What is the appropriate dose of albuterol through the nebulizer for this patient? Albuterol, 1.25 milligrams, repeated once as needed within 30 minutes. Albuterol, 2.5 milligrams, repeated once as needed within 30 minutes. That's the correct dose. For an adult patient, the correct dose of albuterol given through a nebulizer is 2.5 milligrams, which can be repeated once as needed within 30 minutes.